So tonight we're going to look at pure functions and pure functions in JavaScript and what they are and why we might use them and uh, do a dive into functions in general as well. So first we might think what is a pure function? So pure functions are an essential for a variety of purposes, including functional programming, reliable con concurrency, React and Redux applications, but really what defines a pure function? So let's step through a couple of the characteristics of pure functions. So a pure function is what's called deterministic. And this means that given the same input, the function will always return the same output. So let's look at a very simple, but straightforward math terms, or in mathematical terms, we'll look at a function. So a pure function, and we're not gonna go deep into this, so don't worry about the word math. Um, let's say x and y, x plus y. So this is a pure function add is going to be a pure function. And that's because its output is solely dependent on the arguments it receives. Therefore, if it's given the same values, it will always produce the out same output. So if we say add one plus two, or sorry, not one plus two, one comma two, we're always going to get the same output. Oh, not a, add. There we go. Console log missing. Console log add one and two. We're gonna get three. And we could run this a million times. We're gonna get three every single time. Now, if we were to look at, let's say, magic letter equals star and then const create magic phrase phrase and we can say magic magic letter I got my braces all wrong. Okay. So this one looks different. So the create magic phrase, oh, magic should be magic, if I can spell this evening. Create magic phrase function is dependent on a value which is external to its scope. Therefore, it's not pure. So if we say, oh, create magic phrase, we say, Kadabra. We'll get abracadabra. However, if we then change the magic letter to, let's say, and run the same function with the same inputs, oh, we have a const. Let's say let. we see that the, the output changes. And that's because even though we're passing the same exact argument into the same exact function, it's relying on something outside of itself, this magic letter variable. And this magic letter variable can change. 
So that is considered an impure function. Now, a second thing that makes a pure function is a pure function will not cause side effects. And a side effect is any change in the system that is observable to the outside world. So how about, let's say, a good example would be const calculate bill equals sum of cart and tax for sum of cart times tax. So calculate pure calculate bill is pure and is exhibiting the two necessary characteristics. The function depends only on its arguments to produce a result, and that being if sum of cart and tax are the same, we always, or are always going to produce the same output. And the function does not cause any side effects. So side effects in general, but not are generally these things, although not limited to them. Changing the file system, inserting a record into a database, making an HTTP call, mutations, printing on the screen or logging, obtaining user input, querying the DOM, or accessing system state. Now, before we go on, let's talk take a step back and talk about what a function is. So a function is a process which is going to take some input called arguments and produce some output called a return value. And functions in programming most often serve three purposes. They serve mapping, procedures, and IO. So mapping being producing some output based on given inputs. A function maps input values to output values. Procedures being a function may be called to perform a sequence of steps. The sequence is known as a procedure and programming in this style is known as procedural programming. We've, we've seen that before in, in, in things and IO being some functions that exist to communicate with other parts of the system, such as the screen, storage, system log, network, et cetera. So pure functions are all about this mapping. Their, their goal is to map input arguments to return values. So for each set of inputs, there exists an output. A function will take the inputs and return the corresponding output. So something like, math.max and we have let's say two nine three and that will return oh. and that output would be nine so in this example two nine and three are the arguments and their values passed to our function math.max is a function that's going to take any number of arguments and return the largest argument value. So in this case, the largest is nine. So functions are really important in computing and math, as I think we've all seen through our, our work with them. They help us process data in useful ways. So good programmers are going to use give functions descriptive names so that when we see the code, we can see the function names and understand what the function does. So math has functions too, and they work a lot like functions in JavaScript. So if you remember whenever you took algebra or if you blocked it out of your mind forever, um, functions are in algebra. You know, they, if, if you remember the like f of x equals, you know, 2x, that's a function. It's a math function, but it's still a function. It won't work in our JavaScript because it's not the right syntax, but it's kind of, you know, a function. So here we're declaring a function called f and it takes an argument called x and it multiplies it by two, x by two. And 
to call this function and use it, we would do, you know, F2. And that would return to us four. And in algebra, if we see something like F2 in some, you know, equation, we know that's exactly the equivalent of putting four there. So any place we see this function of two, we could substitute four. So if we want to turn this into a function in JavaScript, we could say double x, x times two, and there we go. And we can determine, you know, the output using console log. Console log. Let me say double ten, and that's going to return to us twenty. So in math functions, we know that anywhere we see this f function of two, we could have re replaced with four. And in JavaScript, in our engine, the JavaScript engine will replace this double ten with twenty anywhere that it sees it. So ultimately, this console log double ten is equivalent to a console log twenty in our JavaScript engine. And this is true because this double, this double, there we go, is a pure function. But if double had side effects, such as saving the value to the disk or logging to the console, we couldn't simply replace double 10 with 20. Because that would change its meaning. It's, re it's relying and doing things to code outside of its scope, outside of the function. So if we want to have these references and, and them to be transparent, we need to use pure functions. So one, one clue to what might make something an impure function or just the structure of an impure function is that a function will be impure if it makes sense to call it without using its return value. So that's not something that happens in, in with pure functions. There's, there's no point to a pure function that would have, that would work that way. So, it's definitely a good pattern to use pure functions when you can. And you should use them over other options. They're not, there's no way to write all of your code using pure functions. There are times when you have to use impure functions. So don't try and achieve some level of nirvana where all of your functions are pure because you're, you're going to drive yourself uh, crazy trying to do that. But, Pure functions take some input and return some output based on that input. So they're the, they're the simplest and most straightforward reusable block of code that we can have in a, in a program. It's one of the principles of programming, of, of lots of different things of life, uh, some would say, um, but just, of, of, I guess, of building things. And it's the, you know, the, the KISS principle, if you haven't heard it before, let's keep it simple, stupid. Um, and I've heard that across all different parts of, of things, whether it be programming, whether it be life, whether it be business, uh, just keep it simple, keep it straightforward. And pure functions are stupid simple and, and fit that mold. And so pure functions form the basis of functional programming. Pure functions are completely independent of outside state, and as such, they are immune to entire sets of bugs that have to do with shared mutable state, shared state that changes. Their shared, their not shared state, their independent nature also makes them very 
useful and great candidates for parallel processing across multiple CPUs and across entire distributed computing clusters. So they're very essential when it comes to many scientific and resource intensive computing tasks as well. So outside of just, you know, thinking about a pure function and a redux reducer, using pure functions across many, many scopes, they have many benefits. They're also, because they're, they're so isolated in their little box of themselves, they're very easy to move around and refactor and reorganize in our code because we're not gonna have to worry about what they're calling from and what else they're getting input from, um, you know, the arguments somewhat, but we don't have to worry about the state that they're talking to and calling back to and such. So it makes our programs more flexible and adaptable for future changes. So let's see. Another example, and we had talked a little bit about this to start, but about given the same input, always returning the same output, not all functions are like that, like our double function. So if we did something like math, uh, random each four of these examples would return a different result we would hope I, I guess it's possible that they wouldn't but in the grand scheme of things probability wise they should return different results so even though we didn't pass any arguments into any of these function calls because they all produce different outputs this math.random function is not pure. It produces a new random number every time you run it. So we couldn't just replace it in our code with, with one of those outputs without changing the meaning of what our program is doing. That would end up producing the same result every time, not a random result. So when we ask the computer for a random number, it usually means that we want a different result than we got last time. So you know, what would be the point if we, we had a static number there? That wouldn't make sense. Another thing that is going to be impure is anything that has to do with time. So if we said const time equals uh, new date to uh, time string. And then let's call that let's see anything else we're calling right now. Let's get these out of the console. Uh, keep our console clean as we're doing this. Oh. To locale time. String, oh, date has a capital A, which is causing an issue. Okay. So we see my time 17 or 1925, 22. So if we tried to replace time in a function call with the current time, it wouldn't always, it, it would. No, it wouldn't always say the same time. So we see if we call it again, the time has now changed. 1925.48. So if we actually took this string and input it into one of our function calls on this time function, we would get the same thing every time. So it could only produce the current or the correct output once per day. So that is not something that is going to be pure. Another example of an impure function. So we can also have functions that are pure that will map many input values to the same output value. So as an example, 
let's say we have a high pass function. const high pass. I need to actually write the function first before we call it. Cut off value. And we'll say value greater than equal to cut off. It's going to return a boolean for us. And then if we call that console log. I pass, and we could say five and five. Let's do that three times. I'll run that code, we get true three times. So the same input values will always map to the same output values. Now, let's let's see multiple input values. So we say 150, uh, seven, 45, and a few more where one, zero, uh, three. And with these, we see that we're being consistent and not relying on any external mutable state because it would no longer be referentially transparent or deterministic. So this function is pure, this high pass function. So another thing to look at is immutability. Let's get this counted out. So JavaScript's, art, ob, JavaScript's object arguments are references, which means that a function were to mutate, if a function were to mutate a property on an object or array parameter, that would mutate state that is accessible outside the function. So pure functions must not mutate external state. So let's look at something that is impure. So impure mutates uh, external state. So if we have, let's say, add to cart, we have a cart with a item quantity. And cart dot items dot push item quantity return the cart. So in this function. It works by passing in a cart and item to add to that cart and an item quantity. This function then returns the same cart with the item added to it. The problem with this is that we've just mutated some shared state, the cart in this instance. Other functions may be relying on the cart object state to be what it was before the function was called. And now that we've mutated that state, we have to worry about what impact it will have on the program logic if we change the order in which functions have been called. So re refactoring this code could result in bugs popping up, which could, in this instance, you know, mess up orders or result in unhappy customers or, or whatever. So let's look at a pure version of this. Pure does not mutate. Tate mutate external state. So if we have add to cart equals cart item quantity. And const new cart equals, uh, let's just assume we had 
flow dash in here. Uh, it's just something that could actually work. Clone deep. Uh, cart. And I'm just making a copy of it. Over the object. New cart dot items dot items dot push item quantity. And then once again, return the cart, but now we'll return the new cart. So in this example, we have an array nested in an object, which is why we use this deep clone to, to, to get that, that proper object copied over. And this is, this would be more complex state than most of the time we're dealing with. Um, and for most things, you could probably break it down into smaller chunks, but this just, an example. Um, and we see that in this one, we're not mutating this original cart. So this cart remains the same. So if there's something that relies on the state of that cart, it's going to work just the same. Whereas now we're returning a new cart, so a new, a new object, a new piece of external state or a new piece of state that others can use, but we're not mutating the external state at all. This is where Redux reducers come in. Uh, they can break down state into small parts. And those reducers that are composed, rather than dealing with the entire app state, they just deal with a small part of it. And instead, we could use non-destructive array methods like object assign to update a small part of the app state. So now that we've seen some pure functions and what they do and, and how they're composed. What, what are, are the big benefits of pure functions? I talked about them a little bit at the beginning, but a pure function is gonna be one easier to read as it requires no context. We don't need to know anything about what's going on outside of this function to know what it does and how it works. All we need are its parameters. And that's it. It does not talk or tamper or change the state of the application at all. It's just right here doing its thing. Another benefit is the testability. And that's because pure functions are deterministic by nature. So writing unit tests for them is a lot simpler. Either it, it does what it does, it works or it doesn't, you know, it's going to return the same thing given the same inputs every time. And by design, that means it's either going to work or it's not, it's not, uh, there's no in between it's black and white. Uh, parallel code, something I mentioned earlier, because they're only dependent on their input and cause no side effects. Parallel threads, run, threads running in shared memory are great for um, pure functions. Their modularity and reusability is, you know, they're little units of logic. So because they only depend on the input that we feed them, we can easily reuse these functions between different parts of our code base or different projects altogether. That's kind of the, the idea of, of libraries that we use in JavaScript all the time. When we use a function that's provided to us from a library, it should be consistent. It should return to us exactly what we expect every single time. And referential transparency, big word or big phrase, I guess, because it's two words, but really it's, it's something that is pretty straightforward. Um, a function call could be replaced by its output value. That is referential transparency without changing the overall behavior of the program. So, you know, if, if we knew 
these three items right here, we should be able to take this function call in code, replace it with this new cart, and our code worked just fine. And that's referential integrity. And this is when you think about it as a framework of thought of creating pure functions. If, if where you see your function call, you think, okay, if I take the output of this function and put it right here where this function call is, does it, will it still work fine? And that's, that's pure functions. Um, they're, they're very useful because of how straightforward they are. They deal with this mapping logic. So if you find yourself dealing with procedures or, or IO in your application, you're not writing pure functions. Like I said, there's, there's, I don't think it's possible to write only pure functions. You'll, it's an unachievable goal but doing your best to use them as much as you can will really help the reusability and debugging of your code because it's gonna be a lot more straightforward. It's gonna make our code easier to read, easier to test, and more predictable, which is probably the most important part. And it's, yeah, it's not about ridding our code from side effects and what they do because like I said, it would be, I think, impossible to do. However, it's really about limiting them and really confining them to a specific location so you know exactly where those side effects are coming from. And that way, when you debug, you're not gonna have to debug all your pure functions because you know that they're very straightforward and they're working the way they're supposed to based on, on tests that you will hopefully have. And when you have a pure function, it's a lot easier to write tests for them too. So in the end, you'll know, okay, if I have and found a bug, it's because some weird mutation's happening, something odd is going on in my code. Let me look at my impure functions. Let me look at where my side effects are coming from because that's where something, something odd is being introduced through these interactions. It makes it a lot easier to debug. And yeah, that's... Uh, that's pure functions, a nice little intro to them and, and why we use them and what they do and some examples. And thanks for coming out tonight and have a good evening.